something, somewhere, somewhen, must have happened differently. Petunia Evans married Michael Varis, a professor of biochemistry at Oxford. Harry James Potter Evans Varis grew up in a house filled to the brim with books. He once bit a math teacher who didn't know what a logarithm was. He's read Gödel, Escher, Bach, and Judgment Under Uncertainty, Heuristics and Biases, and Volume 1 of the Feynman Lectures on Physics. And despite what everyone who's met him seems to fear, he doesn't want to become the next Dark Lord. He was raised better than that. He wants to discover the laws of magic and become a god. Hermione Granger is doing better than him in every class, except broomstick riding. Draco Malfoy is exactly what you would expect an 11-year-old boy to be like if Darth Vader were his doting father. Professor Quirrell is living his lifelong dream of teaching defense against the dark arts, or as he prefers to call his class, battle magic. His students are all wondering what's going to go wrong with the defense professor this time. Dumbledore is either insane or playing some vastly deeper game which involves setting fire to a chicken. Deputy Headmistress Minerva McGonagall needs to go off somewhere private and scream for a while. Presenting Harry Potter and the Methods of Rationality. You ain't guessing where this one's going. Okay, okay, Hermione, it's enough. You can stop. The white sugar pill in front of Hermione still hadn't changed shape or color at all, even though she was concentrating harder than Harry had ever seen. Hermione, stop! It's not going to work, Hermione. I don't think we can make things that don't exist yet. Slowly, Hermione's hand relaxed its grasp on the wand. I thought I felt it. I thought I felt it start to transfigure, just for a second. You were probably imagining it. Hoping too hard. I probably was. Slowly, Harry took his mechanical pencil in his hand and reached over to the sheet of paper with all the items crossed out, and drew a line through the item that said, Alzheimer's Cure. That was it for today, right? One more. But that one's small, plus it might actually work. I saved it for last because I was hoping we could end on an up note. It's real stuff, not like phasers. They've already made it in the laboratory, not like the Alzheimer's Cure. And it's a generic substance, not specific like the lost books you tried to transfigure copies of. I made a diagram of the molecular structure to show you. We just want to make it longer than it's ever been made before. And with all the tubes aligned, and the endpoints embedded in diamond. These are all carbon atoms? And Harry, what's the name? I can't transfigure it if I don't know what it's called. Harry made a disgusted face. He was still having trouble getting used to that sort of thing. It shouldn't matter what something was named if you knew what it was. They're called Bucky Tubes, or Carbon Nanotubes. It's a kind of fullerene that was discovered just this year. It's about a hundred times stronger than steel and a sixth of the weight. That's real? Yeah, just hard to make the muggle way. If we could get enough of the stuff, we could use it to build a space elevator all the way up to geosynchronous orbit or higher. And in terms of Delta V, that's halfway to anywhere in the solar system. Plus, we could throw out solar power satellites like confetti. Is this stuff safe? I don't see why it wouldn't be. A bucky tube is just a graphite sheet wrapped into a circular tube, basically. And graphite is the same stuff used in pencils. I know what graphite is, Harry. Harry reached into a pocket of his robes and produced a white thread tied to two small gray plastic rings at either end. He'd added drops of superglue where the thread met either ring to make it all a single object that could be transfigured as a whole. Cyanocrylate, if Harry remembered correctly, worked by covalent bonds. And that was as close to being a solid object as you ever got in a world ultimately composed of tiny individual atoms. When you're ready, try to transfigure this into a set of aligned bucky tube fibers embedded in two solid diamond rings. Hermione laid her wand against one plastic ring and stared for a while. Two small circles of glittering diamond lay on the table, connected by a long black thread. It changed. Now what? She sounded like she was trying to be enthusiastic but had run out of energy. Harry felt a bit deflated by his research partner's lack of passion, but did his best not to show it. Maybe the same process would work in reverse to cheer her up. Now I test it to see if it holds weight! There was an A-frame Harry had rigged up to do an earlier experiment with diamond rods. The earlier experiment had measured whether transfiguring a long diamond rod into a shorter diamond rod would allow it to lift a suspended heavy weight as it contracted. I.e., could you transfigure against tension, which in fact you could. Harry carefully looped one circle of glittering diamond over the thick metal hook at the top of the rig, 
then attached a thick metal hanger to the bottom ring, and then started attaching weights to the hanger. 100 kilograms! I don't think a steel thread this thin would hold that. It should go up much higher, but that's all the weight I've got. There! That one worked! But it's not really useful, Harry, is it? I mean, even if we gave it to a scientist, they couldn't learn how to make lots of bucky tubes from studying ours. They might be able to learn something. Hermione, look at it. That tiny little thread holding up all that weight. We just made something that no muggle laboratory could make. But any other witch could make it. Harry, I don't think that this is working out. You mean our relationship? Great! Let's break up! I mean our research. Oh, Hermione! How could you? You're sweet when you're mean. But Harry, this is nuts. I'm 12, you're 11. It's silly to think we're going to discover anything that no one's ever figured out before. Are you really saying we should give up on unraveling the secrets of magic after trying for less than one month? No. I'm saying right now we should be studying all the magic the wizards already know so we can do this sort of thing after we graduate from Hogwarts. Um, Hermione, I hate to put it this way, but imagine we decided to hold off on research until later, and the first thing we tried after we graduated was transfiguring an Alzheimer's cure. And it worked! We'd feel... I don't think the word stupid would adequately describe how we'd feel. What if there's something else like that and it does work? That's not fair, Harry. You can't put that on people. It's not our job to do that sort of thing. We're kids. For a moment, Harry wondered what would happen if someone told Hermione she had to fight an immortal Dark Lord. If she would turn into one of those whiny, self-pitying heroes that Harry could never stand reading about in his books. Anyway, I don't want to keep doing this. I don't believe children can do things that grown-ups can't. That's only in stories. There was silence in the classroom. Hermione started to look a little scared, and Harry knew that his own expression had gotten colder. It might not have hurt so much if the same thought hadn't already come to Harry. That, while 30 might be old for a scientific revolutionary, and 20 was about right, while there were people who'd got doctorates when they were 17, and 14-year-old heirs who'd been great kings or generals, there wasn't really anyone who'd made the history books at 11. I'm not angry at you. I'm angry at, I don't know, everything. But I'm not willing to lose, Hermione. Losing isn't always the right thing to do. I'll figure out how to do something a grown wizard can't do, and then I'll get back to you. How's that? Okay. We're still friends, right? And if you can't figure out anything... Then we'll study together. Sometimes, Harry hated having a dark side, even when he was inside it. And the part of him that had thought exactly the same thing as Hermione, that no, children couldn't do what grown-ups couldn't, was saying all the things that Hermione had been too frightened to say. Like, that's one hell of a difficult challenge you just grabbed for yourself. And, boy are you going to end up with egg on your face this time. And, at least this way, you'll know you failed. And the part of him that didn't enjoy losing replied, in a very cold voice, Fine. You can shut up and watch. It was almost lunchtime, and Harry didn't care. He hadn't even bothered grabbing a snack bar from his pouch. His stomach could stand a little starving. The wizarding world was tiny. They didn't think like scientists. They didn't know science. They didn't question what they'd grown up with. They hadn't put protective shells on their time machines. They played Quidditch. All of Magical Britain was smaller than a small muggle city. The greatest wizarding school only educated up to the age of 17. Silly wasn't challenging that at 11. Silly was assuming wizards knew what they were doing and had already exhausted all the low-hanging fruit a scientific polymath would see. Hermione still felt a little shaky as she sat down next to Mandy at the Ravenclaw table. It hadn't been as bad as potions class. Sometimes she still had nightmares about that. But this time she had made it happen and she'd felt like its target. Just for a moment, before the terrible cold darkness looked away and said it wasn't angry with her because it hadn't wanted to scare her. And she still had that feeling like she'd missed something earlier, something really important. But they hadn't violated any of the rules of transfiguration, had they? Step one had been to make a list of every magical constraint Harry could remember, all the things you supposedly couldn't do. They hadn't made any liquids, any gases. Step two, mark the constraints that seemed to make the least sense from a scientific perspective. They hadn't taken orders from the defense professor. Step 3. Prioritize constraints that a wizard would be unlikely to question if they didn't know science. The pill! 
That had been something to be eaten! Step 4. Come up with avenues for attacking them. Well, no, nobody would just eat a pill lying around. It hadn't worked, actually. They could have just finite and cantatumed it if it had, but she would still have to tell Harry about that and make sure they didn't mention it in front of Professor McGonagall, in case they were never allowed to study Transfiguration again. Hermione was starting to get a really sick feeling in her stomach. She couldn't eat lunch like this. You could only transfigure whole objects as holes. You couldn't transfigure half a match into a needle. You had to transfigure the whole thing. And that was ridiculous. Things were made of atoms. Lots of tiny little dots. There was no contiguity. There was no solidity. Just electromagnetic forces holding the little dots related to each other. And she began to mentally recite the rules of transfiguration. Harry wanted to kill his eraser. He'd been trying to change a single spot on the pink rectangle into steel, apart from the rest of the rubber, and the eraser wasn't cooperating. I will never transfigure anything into liquid or gas. I will never transfigure anything that looks like food or anything else that goes inside a human body. It had to be a conceptual limitation, not a real one. Had to be. Things were made of atoms, and every atom was a tiny separate thing. No, they really shouldn't have tried to transfigure the pill. Or they should have at least realized. She'd been so caught up in Harry's brilliant idea that she hadn't thought. Atoms were held together by a quantum mist of shared electrons, for covalent bonds, or sometimes just magnetism at close ranges, for ionic bonds or van der Waals forces. If it came down to that, the protons and neutrons inside the nuclei were tiny separate things. The sick feeling in her mindy stomach was getting worse. There was a feeling in her mind of something hovering just on the edge of recognition, a perception about to invert itself. A young woman about to become a crone, a vase about to become two faces. The quarks inside the protons and neutrons were tiny separate things. There simply wasn't anything in reality, the world out there, that corresponded to people's conceit of solid objects. It was all just little dots. Huh, what got into Hermione? The wizards couldn't transform parts of things, could only transform what their minds perceived as wholes because they didn't know in their bones that it was all just atoms deep down. Harry had focused on that knowledge as hard as he could, the true fact that the eraser was just a collection of atoms. Everything was just collections of atoms, and the atoms of the little patch he was trying to transfigure formed just as valid a collection as any other collection he cared to think about. Hermione tore through the hallways, shoes pounding hard on the stone, breath coming in pants, the shock of adrenaline still racing through her blood. And Harry still hadn't been able to change that single part of the eraser. The transfiguration wasn't going anywhere. This. Was. Ridiculous. He was sick of getting experimental results that didn't make sense. Like a picture of a young woman turning into an old crone. Like the cup becoming two faces. What had they been doing? What had they been doing? All right, screw this 19th century garbage. Reality wasn't atoms. It wasn't a set of tiny billiard balls bopping around. That was just another lie. There were no particles. There were just clouds of amplitude in a multi-particle configuration space. And what his brain fondly imagined to be an eraser was nothing except a gigantic factor of a wave function that happened to factorize. It didn't have a separate existence any more than there was a particular solid factor of 3 hidden inside the number 6. If his wand was capable of altering factors in an approximately factorizable wave function, then it should damn well be able to alter the slightly smaller factor that Harry's brain visualized as a patch of material on the eraser. Harry, get out of the classroom! Pure shock crossed Harry's face, and he stood up so fast he almost fell over, and he tore out of the door. Her wand was already in her hand, coming up, pointing at the thread. Finite incantatum. And Hermione slammed the door shut again, just as the gigantic crash of a hundred kilograms of falling metal came from inside. She was panting, gasping for air. She'd run all the way here without stopping. Hermione blinked and realized she had started to fall, and Harry had caught her and was lowering her gently to sit on the floor. Healthy. Are you feeling healthy? Harry started looking even more frightened as the question sank in. I... I don't think I have any symptoms. Good. Catch breath. That took a while. Harry was still looking scared. That was good, too. Maybe it would teach him a lesson. We poked the rules, Harry. 
We broke the rules. I... I still don't see how. I've been thinking, but... I asked if the transfiguration was safe, and you answered me. That's it? She could have screamed. Harry, don't you get it? It's made out of tiny fibers. What if it unraveled? Who knows what could go wrong? We didn't ask Professor McGonagall. Don't you see what we were doing? We were experimenting with transfiguration. We were experimenting with transfiguration. Right. That's probably one of the things they don't even bother telling you not to do because it's too obvious. Don't test brilliant new ideas for transfiguration by yourselves in an unused classroom without consulting any professors. You could have gotten us killed, Harry. Hermione knew it wasn't fair. She'd made the mistake, too, but she still felt angry at him. He always sounded so confident, and that had dragged her unthinkingly along in his wake. We have to stop. We have to stop this or we're going to get hurt. We're too young, Harry. We can't do this. Not yet. A weak grin crossed Harry's face. Um, you're sort of wrong about that. And he held out a small pink rectangle, a rubber eraser with a bright metal patch on it. Quantum mechanics wasn't enough. I had to go all the way down to timeless physics before it took. Had to see the wand as enforcing a relation between separate past and future realities, instead of changing anything over time. But I did it, Hermione. I saw past the illusion of objects, and I bet there's not a single other wizard in the world who could have. Even if some muggle-born knew about timeless formulation of quantum mechanics, it would just be a weird belief about strange, distant quantum stuff. They wouldn't see that it was reality, except that the world they knew was just a hallucination. I transfigured part of the eraser without changing the whole thing. Hermione raised her wand again, pointed it at the eraser. For a moment, anger crossed Harry's face, but he didn't make any move to stop her. Finite incantatum. Check with Professor McGonagall before you try it again. Harry nodded, though his face was still a little bit tight. And we still have to stop. Why? Don't you see what this means, Hermione? Wizards don't know everything. There's too few of them, even fewer who know science. They haven't exhausted the low-hanging fruit. It's not safe. If we can find out new things, it's even less safe. We're too young. We made one big mistake already. Next time we could just die. Harry looked away from her and started taking slow, deep breaths. Please don't try to do it alone, Harry. Please? Please don't make me have to decide whether to tell Professor Flitwick. So you want us to study. Just study. Like you studied, um, timeless physics, right? Harry looked back at her. That thing you did. It wasn't because of our experiments, right? You could do it because you've read lots of books. All right. How about this? We study, and if I think of anything that seems really worth trying, we'll try it after I ask a professor. Okay. She didn't fall over with relief, but only because she was already sitting down. Shall we get lunch? Hermione nodded. Yes, lunch sounded good. For real this time. She carefully began to push herself off the stone floor, wincing as her body screamed at her. Harry pointed his wand at her and said, Wingardium Leviosa. Hermione blinked as the huge weight on her legs diminished to something bearable. You can lift something without being able to hover it completely. Remember that experiment? Hermione smiled back helplessly, although she thought she ought to still be angry. And she started walking back toward the Great Hall, feeling remarkably and wonderfully light on her feet, as Harry carefully kept his wand trained on her. He only managed to keep it up for five minutes, but it was the thought that counted. So, you suspect you might be able to do something that other wizards can't do. Something we think is impossible. Look, I know it's hard to explain. What it adds up to is that what you believe conflicts with scientists believe, in a case where I'd genuinely expect scientists to know more than wizards. Mr. Potter, what you want isn't just impossible, it's illogical. If you change half of something, you did change the whole. Indeed. But Harry is the hero, so he may be able to do things that are logically impossible. Supposing it was possible... Can you think of any reason why the results would differ in any way from ordinary transfiguration? Minerva frowned. The fact that the concept was literally unimaginable was presenting her with some difficulty, but she tried to take it at face value. A transfiguration imposed on only half of a metal ball... Strange things happening at the interface? But that should be no different than transfiguring the object as a whole into a form with two different parts. That is my own thought as well. And Harry, 
If your theory is correct, it implies that what you want to do is exactly like any other transfiguration, only applied to a part of the subject rather than the whole? No changes at all? Yes, that's the whole point. Minerva, can you think of any reason whatsoever why that would be dangerous? No. Likewise myself. All right then, since this ought to be exactly analogous to ordinary transfiguration in all respects, and since we cannot think of any reason whatsoever why it would be dangerous, I think that the second degree of caution will suffice. Minerva was surprised, but she didn't object. Dumbledore was by far her senior in transfiguration. He had tried literally thousands of new transfigurations without ever choosing a degree of caution that was too low. If the headmaster thought the second degree was enough, it was enough. That Harry was certainly going to fail was, of course, completely irrelevant. The two of them started setting up the wards and detection webs. The most important web was the one that checked to make sure no transfigured material had entered the air. Harry would be enclosed in a separate shell of force with its own air supply just to be certain. Only his wand allowed to leave the shield and the interface tight. Harry watched them working, his face looking a little frightened. Don't worry. This almost certainly won't be necessary, Mr. Potter. If we expected anything to go wrong, you would not be allowed to try. It's just ordinary precautions for any transfiguration no one has ever tried before. And a few minutes later, Harry was strapped into the safety chair and resting his wand against a metal ball. One that, based on his current test scores, should have been too large for him to transfigure in less than 30 minutes. And a few minutes after that, there was a small patch of glass on the ball where Harry's wand had rested. Harry didn't say, I told you so, but the smug look on his sweating face said it for him. Dumbledore was casting analytic charms on the ball, looking more and more intrigued by the moment. Fascinating. It's exactly as he claimed. He simply transfigured a part of the subject without transfiguring the whole. You say it's really just a conceptual limitation, Harry? Yes, but a deep one. Just knowing it had to be conceptual limitation wasn't enough. I had to suppress the part of my mind that was making the error and think instead about the underlying reality that scientists figured out. Truly fascinating. I take it that for any other wizard to do the same would require months of study if they could do it at all. And may I ask you to partially transfigure some other subject? Probably yes, and of course. Half an hour later, Minerva was feeling equally bewildered but considerably reassured about the safety issues. It was the same, aside from being logically impossible. I believe that's enough, Headmaster. I suspect partial transfiguration is more tiring than the ordinary sort. Getting less so with practice. But yeah, you've got that right. Congratulations, Mr. Potter. Congratulations indeed. Even I did not make any original discoveries in transfiguration before the age of fourteen. Not since the day of Dorothy Senjak has any genius flowered so early. Nonetheless, I think it would be most wise to keep this happy event a secret, at least for now. Harry, did you discuss your idea with any other person before you spoke to Professor McGonagall? Um, I don't want to turn anyone over to the Inquisition, but I did tell one other student. What?! You discussed a completely novel form of transfiguration with a student before consulting a recognized authority? Do you have any idea how irresponsible that was? I'm sorry, I didn't realize. You must swear Miss Granger to secrecy, and do not tell anyone else unless there is an extremely good reason for it, and they too have sworn. Uh, why? Because you can do something that no one else will believe you can do. Something completely unexpected. It may prove to be your critical advantage, Harry, and we must preserve it. Please, trust me in this. All right. Once we have finished examining your materials, you may practice partial transfiguration on glass to steel and steel to glass only, with Miss Granger to act as your spotter. Naturally, if either of you suspect any symptom of any form of transfiguration sickness, inform a professor at once. As long as we're here, have either of you noticed anything different about Professor Snape? I mean, has his behavior changed recently in any way? Not that I have seen. Why do you ask? 
I don't want to prejudice your own observations by saying, just keep an eye out, maybe? That sent a quiver of unease through Minerva in a way that no outright accusation of Severus could have. Harry bowed to both of them respectfully and took his leave. Albus, how did you know to take Harry seriously? I would have thought his idea merely impossible. The same reason it must be kept secret, Minerva. The same reason I told you to come to me if Harry made any such claim. Because it is a power that Voldemort knows not. The words took a few seconds to sink in. And then the cold shiver went down her spine, as it always did when she remembered. It had started out as an ordinary job interview, Sybil Trelawney applying for the position of Professor of Divination. The one with the power to vanquish the Dark Lord approaches! Born to those who have thrice defied him! Born as the seventh month dies! And the Dark Lord will mark him as his equal! But he will have power the Dark Lord knows not! and either must destroy all but a remnant of the other, for those two different spirits cannot exist in the same world. Those dreadful words, spoken in that terrible booming voice, didn't seem to fit something like partial transfiguration. Perhaps not, then. I confess that I have been hoping for something that would help in fighting Voldemort's Horcrux, wherever he may have hidden it. But... Prophecies are tricky things, Minerva, and it is best to take no chances. The smallest thing may prove decisive if it remains unexpected. And what do you suppose he meant about Severus? There I have no idea. Unless Harry is making a move against Severus, and thought that an open question might be taken seriously, where a direct allegation would be dismissed. And if that was indeed what happened, Harry correctly reasoned that I would not trust that it was so. Let us simply keep watch without prejudice, as he asked. Um, Hermione? I think I owe you a really, really, really big apology. Alyssa Cornfoot's eyes were slightly glazed as she gazed upon the potions master giving her class a stern lecture. Ever since the start of this year, she'd been having trouble listening in potions. She kept staring at their awful, mean, greasy professor and fantasizing about special detentions. There was probably something really wrong with her, but she just couldn't seem to stop doing it. Miss Cornfoot, this is a delicate potion, and if you cannot pay attention, you will hurt your classmates, not just yourself. See me after class. The last four words didn't help her any, but she tried harder, and managed to get through the day without melting anyone. After class, Alyssa approached the desk. Part of her wanted to stand there meekly, with her face abashed and her hands clasped penitently behind her back, just in case. But some quiet instinct told her that this might be a bad idea. So instead, she just stood there with her face neutral, in a posture that was very proper for a young lady. Miss Cornfoot. I do not return your affections. I begin to find your stares disturbing, and you will restrain your eyes henceforth. Is that quite clear? Yes, said Alyssa in a strangled squeak, and Snape dismissed her, and she fled the classroom with her cheeks flaming like molten lava.